We're delighted to have Professor Jennifer Hoffman here today with us uh, as a guest of the Center for the Study of the United States at Tel Aviv University uh, with the Fulbright Program and a guest of the uh, International Program in Conflict Resolution and Mediation. Uh, and uh, the event today is about gender equity in sports. Uh, we'll have a, a few guests late, later from the Israeli uh, uh, sports scene and Professor Hoffman is an expert on the US case and maybe more generally as well. Uh, and we had a few quick questions for you uh, to uh, get things going. Uh, so the first, uh, the first aspect is the aspect of, of policy and, and budget allocation. Uh, if you could give us a few you know, brief insights uh, about, about this topic, we'd be happy. Terrific. Well, in the United States, we do have something called Title IX, which is a federal gender equity policy. Um, and it is specifically policy around protecting uh, women against discrimination in several areas of education, and athletics is included in that. Uh, you had spoke a bit about budget. The power of Title IX really is its p policy power to protect women. Um, but there's no real budget allocation that's assigned to programs to ensure that they reach gender equity. There are some other state level policies that sometimes will not only um, require equity but also allocate funds in a variety of different ways. But that's less common. The most common ways in which we leverage gender equity policy is through the policy itself and then individual institutions have to make the determination about the ways in which they're going to al allocate funds to uh, to reach the aims of the policy. Okay, so, so we know that Title IX made momentous changes in terms of the numbers of female athletes uh, at the high school level and, and at the college level, almost to the point where there's actual equality, close to equality today, at least in some, uh, in some areas of sports. It did have other implications, though, for, the, uh, uh, for other positions, such as coaches and management. Could you tell us a few things about the, the, the role of men and women in those positions? Sure. So before Title IX in the U.S., most athletic programs were separate. So you'd have a men's athletic program and you'd have a women's athletic program. And not only because of Title IX, but because of other um, ways in which higher education was also changing, many programs combined under one unit. Um, and in that co combining of programs, not just in athletics, but in other areas of higher education, when you had separate programs and they combined, you would see whoever was leading the men's program would then lead those combined programs, and women were then shuttled into positions that were more support roles. And then over time, when those roles were, were filled, they tend to be filled by men at the top and women at those other roles. And so the force and the power of Title IX really protects women athletes and women students and ensures equity and access and prevents discrimination. But the policy itself doesn't actually provide protections or provide supports that would then um, elevate women to those other areas of leadership or in the case of athletics with coaching. So Title IX has limits in what it can do in terms of promoting women in leadership positions or in coaching positions. Fantastic. Um, so we, I would like to hear a few insights that you might have about the importance of public exposure and public visibility. Uh, we know that uh, in, in America, as you, as you described earlier, the, the uh, equalization of the, 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 of, the, of the playing field was a result of, of you know, major policy initiative. The likelihood of something like that happening in Israel is uh, probably uh, uh, not very high. And, however, things like you know, public exposure and the kind of momentum that uh, women's sports can get as a result can be very important. So any thoughts about that? Absolutely. So again, the policy protects um, program benefits and ensures that uh, women's athletic programs have equal access to things like media and publicity, but the law is not explicit in the ways in which those things are executed. So there is a wide range of actors and stakeholders, if you will, um, throughout a, a whole range of elements within a, what you might think of as media or policy. So there's the individual institution and the ways in which they might promote men's and women's programs. You have local media and um, other agencies at the local level. And then the way that college sports is organized, there's also a conference level, um, affiliation with media, and then national and international media through, things, through your major sports networks. So there's a wide range of actors that are involved in the promotion and the publicity around women's sport. But at the institutional level, the law only protects um, access to those publicity 
opportunities and the promotion of sports, but it doesn't mandate how that's going to happen. And then you add in all of these other actors, if they don't have their own agenda about promoting men's and women's um, sports equally, then institutions don't have to comply in, in any other particular way. So there's a bit of a, if you build it, they will come. And so when we do see more promotion of women's sports, we, we do see that growing. But unless there's, again, sort of the force of a policy or some sort of resources that's going to continue to foster and further that, um, it can be challenging to get the promotion and the publicity of women's sports to the level that would then sort of help shift that social change and that drive from consumers. And so it's a, a bit of a challenge to think about what are the ways in which we can use policy to then dr drive consumer behavior, and then they would then demand more access to women's sports. Uh, in the media landscape. So there's still a lot of work there to be done. Fantastic. And one last question for today. The title for your talk is Promise and, is Promise and Peril. Mm -hmm. Okay, we talked a little bit about the perils. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, To end on an optimistic note, yeah. if you can talk a little bit about the promise. Sure. Um, title IX in so many ways really is a success story. You look at um, prior to 1972, when there was only about 300,000 girls participating in sports in uh, the high schools in the U.S. And then you look at that growth over almost 50 years now, and there's over 3 million girls that get access to opportunity in their high schools. That's just incredible growth. So as although we do ha still have a lot of work um, in terms of ensuring that all girls get access through their schools to participate in sports, you can just see the wide-ranging external and secondary benefits when you look um, at the landscape in the U.S. of the ways in which women now have opportunities for professional sports, um, the ways in which um, their success at the national level, whether it be with um, the upcoming FIFA World Cup team that will be participating this summer, um, or looking at the Olympics, the recent success in the winter and summer games, it's hard to imagine a world where we would have that level of success for American women. Um, and many women around the world also benefit from this um, by attending colleges and universities and then getting that elite level training and then taking it back. Um, to their home country. So it's hard to imagine both the U.S. women having the success and for women athletes around the world having the success we've seen over this almost 50 years without having this policy in education. Fantastic. So Professor Hoffman, we're delighted to have you here. Thank, Thank you so you. much and thanks our friends from the U.S. Embassy in Israel for uh, helping us hosting you and we're looking forward to your talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.